through nine. This is the word of God. And when they traveled, that is Paul and Silas, through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, <laughs> and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Join me in prayer. I probably ask that the word would accomplish its word of drawing more people to you, opening our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. And while we know that your word also accomplishes the other purpose of hardening those who are reprobate, we plead for your mercy. And we pray that those who are in darkness may come to the light, and those who have blind eyes might be made to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. We spent several weeks, as you know, in Acts chapter 16. And as has been mentioned a number of times, even beginning in the evangelism conference we had, even before we got to Acts chapter 16, uh, we saw three disparate kinds of people brought to Christ. You remember Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened, the merchant. We saw the slave girl who was possessed of the demon. And then we spent four weeks looking at the Philippian jailer, We're looking at principles that we saw in the way that Paul interacted with them. Now we come to this relatively brief account of Paul's interaction in Thessalonica. Like Philippi, the church in Thessalonica would later receive a letter from Paul. Thessalonica, you remember, was the church that later had the problem of so being concerned with the return of Christ, that they were no longer any earthly good. They were neglecting their own duties. They were neglecting to work. They were neglecting earthly responsibility for the sake of waiting for the return of Christ. But here, we don't yet see evidence of any such excessive passivity. In fact, what we see is the early believers in Thessalonica joining in Paul and Silas in their example of suffering, just as Paul and Silas had suffered at the hands of the authorities in Philippi. They are going to suffer, the believers, Jason in particular, are going to suffer at the hands of the mob in Thessalonica. Now, I want us to see here that I want us to, want to remind us that Acts is primarily evangelistic. Some of you who've been with me as we've gone through the book of Acts have heard me say this many times, and I want to drive that point home. Home, <coughs> excuse me. 
and allergies. Uh, my blood work tells me that I do have antibodies to COVID, so I don't think this is COVID. That's right. It's a uh, client says it's tuberculosis. <laughs> it's almost someone have to go to the ER. So, um, so Axe, we believe, I believe, and I've sought to persuade you that Axe is written primarily as, as an evangelistic work. As we preface the work to a uh, um, Theophilus um, in a way of commending Christ. Uh, this book is primarily written as a way of commending Christ and his gospel. And only secondarily, I believe, should we look for principles in the church today that are normative. I think they are there, but they're not primary. So when we look at the way Paul conducted ministry, our first task should be to find Christ there. What does this event tell us about Christ? What does it reflect about Christ and his gospel? And only secondarily should we look for principles in the way the ministry is conducted. Now I want to point out to you here that as Paul is commending Christ to the Jews in Thessalonica, that he's emphasizing an aspect of Christ's person and work that he's not going to emphasize later in the chapter. We're all familiar with Paul's uh, defense of the gospel, his presentation of Christ on Mars Hill, when he addresses the pagan philosophers. And he's going to emphasize something about Christ there that he doesn't emphasize here. We've said before that as Paul encounters different audiences with different backgrounds, Jewish, and it's not just Paul, but we saw with Philip in chapter 8 and, and Peter, even earlier than that, that as Peter and Philip and Paul interact with different audiences, they emphasize different things about Christ. So when Paul speaks to Jews, he emphasizes the suffering of the Messiah, as he does here. And we're going to look and see why they respond the way they do. When he speaks to pagans, he doesn't begin with the Old Testament. He begins with creation and presents Christ as the face, if you will, of the creator. But he addresses pagans differently who are educated, as he does later in this chapter, with pagans who are uneducated. In the same way that Peter addressed Greek-speaking Jews who were not yet fully Jews, who didn't observe the dietary laws and weren't circumcised, differently than he does a Jewish, a fully Jewish audience. So in the book of Acts, what we see is that Christ is presented, the same Christ is presented in many different ways that are perfectly compatible with each other. That Christ is simply presented in different instances. Does that make sense? So here I want us to look at the way Christ is presented in his kingly office but with emphasis on his suffering. Because you'll notice that the Jews who hear about the suffering Messiah in verse 3 present the message that Paul and Silas are bringing when they bring them, drag them to the city authorities with a different emphasis. In other words, Paul and Silas come to the synagogue, and Paul says, I want to present to you, and he spends three, three weeks doing this, we're told. I want to present to you the Messiah. But I need you to understand that the Jesus who was crucified and suffered is the Messiah. And Luke tells us that there were some who believed. Some of the Jews believed, we're told. In verse 4, some along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks, this is the, the non-ethnically Jewish members of the synagogue, and a number of leading women, harking back to Lydia chapter 16. But he says in verse 5, the Jews. The Jews. And I believe that little definite article there is significant. The Jews. I believe it's not improper to infer from that that Luke is indicating the majority of the Jews who heard the message. 
I look here is not being anti Semitic. All right. But he's communicating that the majority of the Jewish hearers are not embracing Paul's message. But when Paul speaks to the Jews in the synagogue, he says, this is the Christ. We need to understand something about this Christ. I know you've read Psalm 96, 97, 98, and 99. Those are the enthronement Psalms about Yahweh being the king over the earth. I know you've read the latter part of Isaiah, where we speak about Yahweh coming down. He's going to establish his reign. Right? I know you've read the end of Zechariah, Zechariah, with its emphasis on the Lord's kingship. I know you've read the, the passages in the Old Testament where God is mighty and he rules over the nations. I understand you know that. But something you don't understand yet is that the Messiah had to suffer. But the same Isaiah who tells us that God and his glory is going to reign over the nations and all the nations are going to stream to Jerusalem. If I may paraphrase here, you need to understand that the reason they're streaming to Jerusalem, whatever you do with that language, is because of this suffering servant that was described in chapter 52 and 53. You have to get that part straight. And I know you don't understand that, and that's why I'm leading with that. But those same Jews who heard about the suffering servant don't go to the city authorities and say, these men who have turned the world upside down are talking about a suffering servant. That's the reason they're angry. The reason they're angry is because Paul and Silas are talking about a suffering servant. And they don't want to hear about suffering. They don't want to believe that their Messiah is a suffering servant. They only want the Yahweh of the Old Testament who's going to be the king and come back and judge the world. And let's start with the Romans. That's who we're really interested in judging. But politics and war make strange fellow dead fellows. And so the very people they want to overthrow, the people who work for the hated Roman government, are the ones that they come to for help. But they don't tell the Roman authorities, the people who have been established on Rome, working for the man, they don't tell them, we have a problem with these guys over here because they're telling us that the Messiah, the anointed one we've been waiting for for centuries, is actually going to suffer. Is this guy who got killed on the cross like a common criminal? Because if they did that, what do you think the authorities would say? We don't care. Right? Like the ones who let Paul go earlier and said, these, these men have done nothing worthy of death. Right? They would say, we don't care. But the Jews know that the only way they can get the city authorities who are put in place by Rome to really care about it is if they switch gears and say, now we're interested in getting you uh, getting you on board because we want to know these guys are threatening you by preaching another king named Jesus. Notice nothing about who was killed on the cross like a common criminal by your government. Right? Nothing about that. You see, they want to play both sides of the fence. They like the idea of the Messiah as a king when it promises them earthly reign, earthly freedom, earthly freedom from Rome, earthly victory over the hated Roman Empire, national autonomy. They like that Messiah. What makes them angry is the idea that the Messiah would suffer. But when they go to the, the authorities, they know the authorities don't care anything. They're not threatened by a suffering servant the way the Jews are. So they shift gears. And they say, These, you need to get on board with us because these people are preaching Jesus, who is a king, not Caesar. So that's how they get them on board. And ironically, the ones who are made angry at the idea that their Messiah would suffer are the very ones who want Paul and Silas and the early church in Thessalonica to suffer. We don't want our guy to suffer. We don't want our concept of Messiah to be a suffering Messiah, but we do want you to suffer. 
Because you're telling us about a suffering son. See how that works? Okay. So all of this is prologue to what I want to tell you about the way this Luke tells us about Christ here. What's Christ? What does Luke emphasize about Christ? Now, I've made the case before following a professor I had in seminary who was in our denomination that Luke's writings, his gospel and his, his uh, record of church history acts, are primarily a way of commending Christ to us as the fulfillment of Isaiah 52. Luke's primary goal in writing his gospel and his book of Acts is to present Christ as the suffering servant of Isaiah 52. But as you follow the progress of the gospel in the book of Acts, the way he's fulfilling that is that he's being presented to the world as the king. His kingship is always behind the, behind the scenes, causing the gospel to go forward. So he is the suffering servant who is now the king. And that's exactly what we see in Acts 17. But let me ask you this question. Does Jesus threaten you? I'll be honest. Does Jesus threaten you? Is Jesus a threatening person? One of the kids says no. On the mouth of infants, that's all maybe. If Jesus were not a safe threat, why were Paul and Silas persecuted? First of all, if Jesus wasn't a threat, why was he crucified? Threat to somebody. If Jesus were not a threat, then why does Luke tell us in verse 5 that the Jews were jealous and were willing to partner with wicked men? Wait a minute, Pharisees. I thought you were all about being pure and separated. Wait a minute, it seems. Remember the seems? So those are the guys who said, even the Pharisees aren't pure enough. We have to go off in the desert and live in a colony somewhere and wait for, they were like early that Jewish festival like We've got to wait for the Messiah to come. I thought you guys didn't want to be around the wicked guys. That's the reason you hate the Roman tax collectors, work for the government. Oh, and now you're willing to work with wicked men? They're willing to work with wicked men because they're threatened. Why do you think the magistrates in Philippi threw Paul and Silas in prison? Because they were threatened. Why was the crowd in, we haven't gotten there yet, but in chapter 18, we're going to get to Ephesus, and the crowd goes berserk, absolutely berserk, for like, what is it, something like three hours? They have a riot and say, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, because they're threatened. to you that you and I on some level, because we're not fully sanctified, that all of us including me are threatened by Jesus in some way. He's the one that Michael Card called the God who we most fear, the friend that we most fear. Christ is the friend that we most fear. And why is he doesn't threaten us? He doesn't just threaten those people out there. He threatens us. Because we're not perfectly sanctified. If we were perfectly sanctified, which I'm not, we wouldn't find him threatening. That's why we're going to adore him in heaven. Because we won't be sinful. I won't be sinful in heaven. Wonder of wonders. My motives will actually be pure in heaven. Wonder of wonders. And yours will be too. But until then, we still have this thing, this problem called indwelling sin. Yes, it's dead. Yes, it's no longer powerful over us. Romans 6. Paul writes Romans 7 after Romans 6. Paul is the one who tells us that the, the flesh is dead. And yet Paul goes on in chapter 7 to say he's got a problem with his flesh. And that's the reason we find Jesus threatening. 
Now I haven't gotten my three points, and that's already six minutes till noon. So I'm gonna make this quick, okay? But I think it's strange for us to think of Jesus as being threatening. So briefly, Jesus as the suffering servant threatens us. Why does he threaten us? Because he threatens our idea of earthly security. Raise your hand if you want to suffer. No one. We don't like suffering. We don't want suffering in any way that interrupts our sense of security. Whether it's a health issue or a financial issue or a family issue or a job issue or whatever it is. An anxiety issue, a depression issue, whatever it is, we don't want to suffer. And we absolutely don't want to suffer for Christ. Now we say we do. We say we're willing to, and I hope we are. We say we're willing to. But that's like that's like extra suffering, right? It's like not enough. We suffer from all the things in the world that everybody else suffers from. We suffer from health problems, all the things I just mentioned. People problems, job problems, family problems. We all suffer from that. Everybody does. But to suffer for Christ goes beyond that. It's like taking the extra step. Because now, as Peter says in 1 Peter, you're suffering for the sake of righteousness. On top of the suffering that everybody else in the world encounters, now you're telling me because I follow Christ, I have to suffer additionally? Like, how does that happen? Where did I sign up for this? I thought the guys on the television told me that I'm supposed to have a better life as a result of being a Christian. Right? And that's the reason it's a false gospel. Not only because they neglect the doctrine of the atonement, but because they have this vision of the Christian life that God doesn't want you to suffer. Well, apparently Jesus didn't have enough faith. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what they want you to believe, the guys on TV, right? But see, we laugh about that, and I do too, because it's ridiculous, patently false. But what do we expect? We expect to have a life that's free of suffering. And we do everything in our power to escape suffering. Right? I mean, some of you know that I got a good bill of health this past week. And my oncologist in Albuquerque says she's going to refer me to a team in Denver. See, I get a transplant. I'd like to get a transplant. Why? Because I would like to live longer than two to five years or whatever my time frame is. All right? I would prefer not to die in two to five years. So I'm right there with you. Nobody wants to, we all say we want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go today, right? <laughs> right? But to suffer for Christ is even more threatening. I can't imagine what it must be like in Afghanistan right now for a Christian. I can't imagine what it's like in Indonesia. I can't imagine what it's like in Vietnam, all those places where Christians are being targeted. Okay? And Jesus threatens our sense of security because we know that Christ suffered. He's called a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Yes, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we go from faith to faith, we're being transformed from glory to glory. But 2 Corinthians is also the one that tells me he's in, in danger on water, in danger on land, in danger from, uh, you know, bandits, in danger from uh, the Jews, in danger of persecuted, uh, you know, given the 40 strikes minus one twice, I think it was. Also the one being persecuted left and right. His whole ministry is one of persecution. Oh, I'm in jail again. Well, nothing to do but write some letters to churches, right? That's Paul's life. And on some level, I think we all recognize that that's not a life we want. And so Jesus suffering, we have to recognize that there's a part of us that responds to the idea that, Christ, that the man that God ordained to make his kingdom visible suffered. And that message is offensive to us as well. It's not just the ones, the Jews in the synagogue in Thessalonica. On some level, you and I have the same problem. That's why we pay, I say we as a society, that's why we pay these guys on the television and in the bookstores 
to tell us that our life is going to be great if we just follow Jesus. If we just have enough faith, our life is going to be great. And it's not true. Secondly, there's another aspect of Christ here that threatens us. And it's Christ as the risen king. You see, the, the suffering servant is the one who makes enemies, the Jews, to persecute Paul and Silas, and eventually Jason. But it's the threat of a risen king that threatens the earthly authorities. But brothers and sisters, are you and I not like that in some way? How does the risen Christ threaten us? Well, he threatens our autonomy. He threatens our autonomy because our consciences know that at some level, it's our, what Paul calls our flesh. Christ calls us to do something that we don't want to do. You know what it is? Die. He, didn't, he wants us to die. But what do we have to die to? We have to die to our sin. We have to die to our flesh. We have to die to the value system of the world. We have to die to the, the hooks of the, of the devil who wants to pull us, as James says, using our desires, our sinful desires, to pull us away from Christ. And at some level, we don't want that. And we like the idea of a suffering servant as long as the suffering is over there somewhere. But as soon as the risen Christ, the victorious king, tells us, Shelby, I would like you to do this thing that you don't want to do. Or Shelby, I would really like you to not do this thing that your flesh would really love to do. All of a sudden, that threatens our autonomy. But we may not be in positions of political authority like the city authorities here. But doesn't Christ threaten our autonomy in some way? Doesn't he call us to do something we don't want to do? It's actually the way of life, not the way of death. What we want is the way of death. Right? That's what Jesus said in John 3. Men love darkness instead of light. You know, Sheldon, this is the way of life. This is the way of wisdom. This is the way of light. No, I'd much rather walk in death. Can I please just walk in death just for a little bit? Can I walk in darkness just for a little bit? Isn't that what we do? Well, let me just say this one thing. Let me just have the fun of saying this one thing to one person no one knows about. Let me just have the fun of thinking this one thought. Let me just have the fun of doing this one thing. It's our autonomy. Now you think, bless me. If Christ, if Christ threatens us with his suffering and Christ threatens us as the risen king, then where's the comfort? Where's the gospel? Well, the gospel is that Christ as the risen king is the one that gives us strength to suffer. Christ by his spirit is the one that actually changes our hearts so that we want to obey him. That we recognize because our eyes have been opened to see that what he calls us to is life and not death. He's the one that changes our perception so that we understand that, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we are the aroma of life. The message of Christ is the aroma of life, not the aroma of death. He's the one that changes, opens our eyes to see that he is glorious. And he's more glorious than college football. <laughs> As they were teasing me this morning. He's more glorious than when your team wins. He's more glorious than when the polit political party that you like gains power. He's more glorious than when the stock market goes up. He's more glorious than when everything in your life is just the way you want it to be. He's more glorious than having a life that you think must be your best life now. He's more glorious than that. His suffering and rising again is more glorious than that. And the reason we don't believe that is because we're sinful. It's because we're weak. It's because we're ignorant. It's because we're foolish. It's because we're rebellious. And the gospel is that not only does Jesus forgive us for all that stuff. He actually changes us so that we become like him. 
And yes, it's suffering. Because he suffered. But the author to Hebrews, the Hebrews said, the author of Hebrews said that it was for the joy set before him that Christ suffered. Why don't we just, why don't we have joy? Because we don't have faith. And why don't we have faith? Because we're sinful and we're weak and we're foolish. And the good news is that Christ even gives us the faith to believe in him, not just for salvation, but he gives us the faith to walk every day with that. So it's not like God has set you free in Christ and then left you on your own to your own devices, as one other person said. It's that he sustains you. The risen Christ, who is the king, is the one who sustains you in suffering. Not just in the suffering that happens to everybody, but particularly in your suffering as a Christian. As you put to death the deeds of the flesh, as you seek to resist the silent call of the world, and as you even stand against the devil, Christ, the risen king, is the one who gives you the strength to do that. That's not too good to me. Pray. Give us faith, we pray.